your Savior. That means a lot, amen? And there's always joy. There's Tom Turner back there. And in the Lord, there is joy. Because in the Lord, there is hope. There is, light, there is light, and we see it, and we can understand it. And so, this is the joy class, and we try to have joy. Because there's reason to have joy, and even in one another. Well, we have some special things this morning, and one is a special surprise. We've got some folks here today that are going to uh, play the piano for us. Uh, and if you don't mind, uh, Lori, just tell us what's on board for us. Thank you so much for being here. Oh, we're, we're excited. y'all this morning they prepared some Christmas songs and Natalie is going to go first and she's going to play He is Born and then Sadie is going to play last and she's going to play Joy to the World. Good job. Thank you, Sadie. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you for practicing so much. You did a good job. That was wonderful. Is that it? All right. We could take some more of that, but thank you so much, girls. Have a good day. All right. All right. And David, I'll just let you know we got a mic out here with Rick. I'm going to have him to lead us in prayer. It's the white one, I think. All right. So let's see where we are here. Okay. What did I put my paper all righty, I'm like the hen with a bunch of little chicks, you know, trying to keep up with all their little, you know, in the country, we call them biddies. But anyway, keep up with all my papers. Well, let's see. We want to talk about some prayer requests and some announcements. Uh, for, as far as announcements, not a lot. You got a prayer list. Anybody need a prayer list? Tom, you got a prayer list? Okay, anyone? All right, so we'll use the prayer list one more week, and then we'll get a new one in January. How about that? All things new. 2021, that'll be good, won't it? We'll wave goodbye to 2020. Yes, sir. One guy said, he said, I'm not so interested in seeing the new year, as interested in seeing the new year come 
as I am to see the old one go. I can say amen to that. But we'll get a new prayer list next week. If you have a request that's not on there, if you'll let me know. And it primarily is for our joy class or immediate families. We'll be glad to put it on the list when the new one comes out. Let's see, for, um, for that and then next week, I want to ask your favor to uh, do this for me next week. Today, we are doing lesson, I think it's number eight. Uh, the number is, I think it's what it is. I believe it's eight. But uh, next week, I want to I wanna try your patience again, and I want us to put nine and ten together. And I think the reason for that is the material kind of lends itself, and then, Lord willing, that will be the last time we put two together, and we'll have three after that, 11, 12, and 13. We'll do them separately. But just remember that 9 and 10 next week. Now, could I ask your help on something else? Uh, we're going to do a, a meal for the Turner family. And so this morning, I would like to get a few tables set up over in the parlor. Um, men, if there's any man that would be able to go over and help me do that right after the service, just come see me after Sunday school and let me know if you can. We're only talking about four tables, and I can do it myself, but if you want to go over and help me, that would be good. Then, ladies, if you would be available on Tuesday, we're going to serve the meal at 11 on Tuesday, and we need a few ladies that could help, maybe just to kind of put things in order about 10.30. And then the view, let me give you the times. Um, Sweet Ree Turner passed away on Thursday, and... Uh, Funeral is at 1. Noon on Tuesday is the visitation here at the church. The funeral is here at the church. And at 11, that's when the, we're feeding the family, and it's just for the family. Not for, you know, not for us, but we do need some helpers. So those are the times, Tuesday, and everything's at Lakeside. And then, um, uh, so that's, that's what I wanted to get across to you. So we just need a little bit of help, ladies. We could have maybe about three that would help. Um, Tom told me that Re had, uh, you know, she'd battled cancer for a long time and it had sta it reached stage four some time ago. So she did really well, number one, to last this long, and number two, the Lord was gracious that she didn't have a lot of pain and how, how gracious that is. Then on your prayer list, Julian is not here today, but they're having a family get-together, so he's okay. He did have uh, earlier in the week his uh, shingles kicked up again, and they are giving some medicine to try to help alleviate that. And there's Miss Mayo Shed. Hey, man, good to have you back again. I know you've been ailing a little bit, but uh, she's here with us today, and it's so good to see you again, Miss Mayo. All right, so and then... Um, so just, but do continue to remember him. He'll have another treatment tomorrow. And so pray for Julian and Sybil. Gerald Owen was so grateful. We gave him some uh, cards. The class got some of them together. And uh, he so enjoyed that. He, he got very emotional, his son Jerry said, when he tried to tell him about getting those Christmas cards. And you can still send some over to NHC. <clears throat> I'm sure they would get it to him if you didn't get it in in time. If you would also remember Ken Gill, continue to pray for him. Also Pat Robertson, good to see John Sells. He's back in, where are you John, over here? Okay, he had been out with a cold, good to have him back again. Russell Young did have his surgery, continue to remember him for recovery. And then uh, if you would remember Sandy Hall, for this coming Tuesday she's having a test, and so pray for Sandy that things will go well. Uh, Stephanie Yoho, not a member of our class, but dearly beloved, and with many issues, pray for Stephanie. How about an unspoken request? Anybody have an unspoken request? Yes. Jim has been ill. Oh, he's healed. Okay, okay. Okay, okay, wonderful. Thank you, Joe. It's great to hear. It's great to hear. God is answering prayers in many ways. I've asked Rick Atwell if he'd lead us in prayer today if you'd do that for us, Rick.
Dear gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. We thank you for this opportunity and this privilege to be here today, Lord, to worship you, to serve you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for this church. Uh, we thank you for this Sunday school class, Heavenly Father. We thank you for uh, Brother John. We just pray that you'll bless him and be with him today as he brings uh, the message from the Word of God. We, we pray, Heavenly Father, for the many people that um, have been mentioned here today, Heavenly Father, that... Uh, different things that they're dealing with, Lord, with the sickness and uh, just spiritual issues with folks, Lord, financial problems, Heavenly Father, just because of the work situation in this country. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, you'll be with Brother Tom as, as he deals with the loss of his wife, uh, Miss Ree, and we just pray that you'll bless him, help him, give him grace, Heavenly Father. Uh, we pray, Heavenly Father, for Brother Julian, that you'll continue to uh, work in his body, Lord, and that these um, different uh, procedures that they're using, Lord, that they'll they'll work in his body, Heavenly Father, that he'll be healed uh, from the cancer that he's dealing with, Lord. We pray for the many um, women here at the church, Lord, that have widowed ladies that have lost their husbands, dear gracious Heavenly Father. Please be with them, with uh, Miss uh, Linda Fay and um, or Miss Fay Hayes. Uh, and, and Lord, just pray that you'll be with them, help them, bless them, and give them grace, dear gracious God. And we just pray that you'll uh, continue to be with this country, help us, lead us, and guide us, protect us, Heavenly Father, uh, from just the, the evil and the wickedness that's going on in this country, dear gracious God. And we just pray that you'll be with the service to come, uh, that you'll bless the, the pastor that will be preaching. Uh, and Lord, if there's anyone today that doesn't know the Lord Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, that today would be the day of salvation. Thank you for your, your wonderful mercy, your grace. We love you, Heavenly Father. We pray all these things in our Lord and Savior's name. Amen. Mm, amen. Thank you. And the reason I like to have someone to pray, this is our class. You know, it's not my class. It's participation by everyone. And we can certainly all pray and... and um, all of that. Good to have uh, Ken Madden and his sister. It's Josephine, right? Good to have Josephine with us. And then we have a guest. Is this your guest, uh, um, Joe? My brother John, baby brother. Oh, the baby brother. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah. There you go. There you go. So it's John. Okay, so I've met Jim and, and Joe and John, and there's a bunch of brothers, right? Wow, amen. Glad to have you here, John. All right, well, let's turn in our Bibles to the book of Galatians chapter 4. Galatians 4. Our title today is From Slavery to Sonship, and then our key verse is... Uh, it's going to be 4-7. I think what we'll do is we'll read verses 4 through 7. So we're in Galatians 4, uh, beginning in verse 4, and read down to verse 7. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. And isn't it interesting, on our, on our Christmas week, the Lord gave us a Christmas verse. And uh, here's a different one from the book of Galatians, a good Christmas verse. Verse 5, his purpose, to redeem them that were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of sons. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. And then our key verse, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So there we have um, our thought today as far as privileges as the children of God. And I look at last week's ver uh, lesson, it's kind of like what the law could not do, whereas in this lesson today, it's what faith in the Lord Jesus does do. We have two main points in our lesson. One is the illustration of the plight of those under the law. And then secondly, the application of that illustration to the, uh, the privileges that we have in faith, with faith in Christ. 
So an illustration here uh, of the, uh, what the Lord's trying to get across here, the illustration of those <clears throat> that are under the law. And that is, we're going to look at verses 1 and following here. <clears throat> Galatians 4.1. All right, let's uh, pick it up right there. He says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all. That uh, phrase, uh, got to clear the pipes out here again, but anyway. That phrase, now I say, <clears throat> and it's kind of like the Lord is saying, well, I want to give you something here. Let me explain this to you. So he uses an illustration of an heir who is a child. And so we're talking about, we're talking about an heir. What is an heir? Um, we have the word inheritance. So what is an heir? An heir is someone who he inherits, doesn't it? It could be property, possessions wealth, a business, <clears throat> but he's an heir. In other words, he's going to receive some things. So it's in verse 1 that the heir, so here's someone with wealth, or he might be a king, and he's got a son who's, who's his heir, maybe more than one. But then it talks about the condition of this heir, as long as he is a child. Now we're talking about, you know, maybe he's a toddler, maybe he's five or six or seven, but he's a minor, uh, he's a minor child. He's not come to years, you might say. What he's illustrating, though, he says, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be Lord of all. So, you know, in Bible times, in the book of uh, Romans, we, we uh, um, I think, maybe have some illustrations about adoption that we have. Well, the Roman people is very common they had servants. And so here's a man and a wife, and they're, they're wealthy enough. They have servants, and it, you didn't really have to be that wealthy. Servants, just about half the people in the time of Rome were servants, or we might even say slaves, some of them of different conditions. But anyway, if you had servants, or they had servants, so when their child comes along, they would take one of their servants who had been trained and educated, and they, that servant would take that child under his or her wing, and many times it was a him, take the child under his wings, and he would train the child. And that child, he may even dress the child just like all the other little servant childs, you know, children. They're going to play together. They're going to go out to the field and work together. And so it's saying even though this, this son, he's an heir. He, he's going to inherit everything. But while he's a minor child... He's just like one of the servants. And in verse uh, 2, it goes on to say, but he's under tutors and governors until the time appointed of the father. So the Lord is, the Lord is giving us an illustration. The heir, he's a child. And uh, the servants tell him what to do. It says he's under tutors. He's under governors. And so here's this child. He may not even know he's, what it means to be an heir. And his, his people that he, the little children he plays with, they may treat him no different. You know, he's, he's just one of them. But the father has a plan. The father has put some tutors over him to teach him. You know, the, in, uh, I've read some about King James, uh, the, the king of England, King James, uh, I think it was the sixth, but he was the first it was the king of Scotland, even very young, and then became the king over England as well. But he was trained. Uh, he learned many languages. Uh, in their home, they often, though he was English, he, they often spoke French. He knew Latin. Uh, he had some guests one time that came, and, and uh, the tutors wanted to show him off. And so he could quote chapters of the Bible. This is King James, you know, the King James Bible era. He could quote chapters of the Bible. He, uh, you could show him Latin. He could read the Latin and then translate it in his mind into French. And then he could translate that French into another language. And this was at the age of eight. So even though, you know, he would be worldly known as a king, he was under tutors and he was under governors. And those governors taught him, they taught him manners. And they taught a child, you know, like the old days, you know, speak when you're spoken to and be quiet when adults are talking. 
And, you know, don't come to the table and start grabbing. You know, you sit at your place and wait. All those kind of things. And he might say, well, I'm, I'm an heir. Doesn't matter. You're a child. And you've got to do what the governor says or the tutor says. Now, what is the illustration here he's trying to get across? The heir, though he's in verse 1, says he's, he's, though he be Lord of all, he's, that's coming to him. But verse 3 explains what, he's, what the Lord is getting at. Even so we, when we were children, were in bondage under the elements of the world. And Paul is not saying when we were young in years. He's saying when we were under the Old Testament law, we were the heirs who were the minor children. We were that. So he's saying just like the heir you know, had to do all these rules and this uh, be trained and all of that, and he was bound, he was not free to do what he wanted to do. He had to play, uh, pay close attention. He's saying the Old Testament law was in a sense bondage in verse 3. We're in bondage under the elements of the law. So we're talking about primarily Jews of the Old Testament. So bondage, like the child being told what to do and the chores to do. And then he says, under the elements of the world. And I'll be honest with you, that's not easy to understand exactly what it means. But how about this? When your children start to school, what school do they start in? Well, kindergarten, but where do you find the kindergarten? It starts with an E. So elementary, why? It's the ABCs. It's the foundation. And the, the Lord is saying here that the Old Testament Jews, they were under the ABCs of worldly laws. In fact, they're called that in some place, even carnal laws. In other words, it had to do with many of the outward things, how they dressed, you know, days of the week, what you could eat, what you couldn't. Things having to do more with worldly and visible not with heavenly or inwardly. Now, a couple of thoughts under that is they were in bondage under the elementary things. This is the, so when, when we got to divide, right? We got the Old Testament. We got the New Testament. We're in the New Testament. We're in the age of grace. Christ has come. We, we know he died, was buried, rose again, ascended into heaven. We now worship in churches. We are not worshiping in synagogues. We don't offer sacrifices. We're in the New Testament age. Before Jesus came, they were in the Old Testament age, which is the age of law. And under the law, you know, Moses gave, God gave the Ten Commandments to Moses, and he was kind of the mediator that handed out the law. And then there were many, many, many laws and regulations of eat this, don't wear two kinds of clothing, just all kinds of things, you know, days of the week, feast days, sacrifice days. And so this, this bondage was, I would say, in kind of like in three ways. Number one is they were in, still in somewhat of darkness. They didn't understand all that this meant. Now, by faith, yes, they did look forward to the coming one. Amen? We look back to it. They look forward to it. But just like the heir who's been developed and trained by these tutors and governors, didn't understand why all this was being done to him. You know, why can't I, you know, why can't I go out and, and just run the streets like the neighbor's kids? Why do I have to study Greek and Hebrew and all of this kind of stuff and Latin? And why do I have to learn and do this? Why do I have to behave? And why do... He may not have understood all that in the Old Testament people, the Bible talks about them searching, you know, trying to understand what this meant. So there was a sense of darkness in that bondage. But wouldn't you agree there was also a sense of distance between them and God? For example, when Moses came down from the mountain and he, del he had the law in his hands and, you know, when he would go back to the mountain and that mountain would smoke and it would be fire and thunder and lightning on that mountain. You know what the people said? Well, the Lord said the people must not touch the mountain. He, he even warned Moses a second time, put boundaries, don't let them. 
Well, after a while, when they saw the, you know, the mountains and smoking and thunders and lightnings and all of this, they didn't want it. They said to Moses, you speak to God, and then you speak to us. We don't, you know, we don't want to get close. So just like that, you know, God was to be dreaded. God was to be feared. And, and there was a sense of distance. And where is in today, it's really not that way. And we'll see that in some of the terminology. So there was darkness. They didn't understand it all into the Old Testament. There was a distance. But then there was also so many of the duties which we've touched on. But why did God say so many times, thou shalt not, thou shalt not, thou shalt not? The reason he did it is because he was giving laws to a carnal people, and I'm talking about all of us, a carnal, worldly-minded people, to try to restrain them from doing things that they would ordinarily do. So there was punishments and threats, and it was with a stern lawgiver because he was trying to restrain people from doing worse than what they did do. When we lived in New Jersey, we had a dog, and uh, this dog's name was Simon's. And I'll tell you, I don't know dog language, but I know a little bit about dog behavior, but Simons would have paid every, everything he could have ever got if I would have given him 10 minutes with a mailman. <laughs> we had a little uh, uh, mailbox on the house, and it was made of cast iron, and when the mailman would flip that lid up and it would hit, it would go clank, and Simons would just be going crazy in the backyard. But there was one thing that always saved the mailman, <laughs> and it was a chain. Now, I know you shouldn't have dogs on a chain, but we were low income. We didn't, couldn't afford a fence at that time. But if it had been a fence, it would have been the fence that would restrain Simons from the, from the mailman. But it happened to be a chain. But I, he had a good chain. It was good, and we, we took good care of him and had a nice insulated house for him, and if it was real cold, we would bring him in. But anyway, that was to restrain him from that behavior that he had. Now, that's a very lowly, humble illustration, but the Old Testament laws were given to prevent God's people from being just like everybody else. And it was motiva motivated both by reward but also by fear. And so the duties, and, and Paul, Paul and the Lord is saying that the Jewish people, when they were children under the Old Testament age, were in bondage. So that's what we, we have. But notice, it says about, uh, back up in verse 2, that the heir, though he is a child, until the time appointed of the father. Now there would come a time when uh, this this heir would not be as a servant anymore, this time appointed. And it's called, um, it's actually called, well, we'll get into the word adoption later. Uh, so maybe I'll just, I'll just hold that. But I would like to share a thought with you. We're dealing with things here about Old Testament and New Testament, law and grace. And we might say, well, you know, truly, we're not, we're not, thinking about going back under the law, why do we need this? It's like if you're on a trip and you get, sometimes you get diverted from your main trip and you have to go on a side trip. There are things you'll see on the side trip you wouldn't have seen. For example, say you had relatives in Philadelphia and you decide to go up I-77 and hit the Pennsylvania Turnpike and you're going to go on over to Philadelphia. You've never been there before but about an hour or so out of Philadelphia, your car begins to overheat and you pull over to the gas station. They say, man, you got some pretty serious trouble. But if you'll go down this road for about 20 miles, you'll come to a city, a little town called Lancaster or Lancaster, PA. And you've never heard of Lancaster, PA, but you drive in there and you, you come to a place and you begin to see horse and buggies and you see people plowing the horses. You say, what is going on here? And then you come to a, a place where they take care of your car and they say, well, you're going to have to stay here a couple of days. Why don't you go up at the bed and breakfast? It's an Amish family and they'll keep you. And uh, there's a shuttle that takes you out into the countryside and you'll be able to see all this stuff. You didn't, you didn't know anything about Lancaster. You'd never, you'd never thought about visiting there, but you had a little bit of trouble. 
And so because of that, you, you were able to see things that you wouldn't have otherwise have seen. Well, in the same way, if it had not been for the Galatians having trouble that they were having, we wouldn't see these things. Now, here's a, here's a wonderful verse, the next verse. Now we're into the second major point, is the privileges of those in Christ. And look at this verse in verse 4. We wouldn't have this if the Galatians hadn't had their trouble and uh, we got diverted off our main trip, maybe. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his Son, made of a woman, made under the law. You know, there are five words in that verse that I think are the, the most powerful words uh, of the verse and of this section, and it's God sent forth his Son. Think about that. God sent forth his son. Now, you know, how can we, how could we relate that? You know, we can just read the verse and take it at face value, but could we just kind of maybe in our imagination say, what, how could I compare God sending his son? How about this? How about there's a war going on, maybe World War II? And the father has, he has his only son, and, he, and uh, his son has be, been drafted. And he's been, to, he's been to boot camp, and he gets, come, he gets to come home one more time before going overseas. The family gets together, and they meet with the son. And then after that family get-together is over, the dad and the son, they go down to the train station. And that father, you know, he's sending forth his son. And you know there's a lot of emotion in sending forth his son. And so, can you kind of maybe just apply that to the Heavenly Father? That the angels, you know, they're worshiping the Son, but it comes time for the Father to send forth His Son. What a picture. And when did He do it? In the fullness of times. You know, sometimes they do things, they measure things with pulling strings or laser marks. And it's kind of like when all the laser marks fell at one point, God says that's the time for him to come. When all the prophecies got connected and all the roads got built that Rome was going to build and the Greek people got a universal language in their day, Greek, God said it's time. And as Daniel predicted in all these... Even today, reading out of Micah, where thou Bethlehem, Judah, you know, he shall uh, be born of thee that comes forth to be ruler. And so in the fullness of the time, that's when it happened. Boom. There in the stable, God sent forth his son in the stable, in a manger. Little, helpless, but I'll say he is Lord of all. Amen. And so this statement, God sent forth his son. How he was sent, verse 4 also says he was made of a woman. He wasn't made of man and woman, amen? He was a virgin boy. God was his father. And he just acquired a human body through Mary. But not only born un of a woman, but born under the, under the law. So he is the one bearing the banner of grace and says, I'm coming to free the children. I'll be born under law, and I'll fulfill all of the law. I'll obey it all perfectly, and I'll be the perfect sacrifice so that I can free the children and give them freedom. Born under the law. Uh, some people have said, you know, is he, could he have been of a different nationality? Are you kidding? You know, what boat did they get off of? I don't know, but anyway... And then, so that's how he was sent. And then verse 5, what was the purpose? To redeem them that were under the law. So, number one, to redeem them, to buy them back from the penalty of sin, but also the servitude of the law, being just as a servant under bondage, to redeem them and buy them back. And then a second purpose, it says that we might receive the adoption of sons. Can I tell you a little bit about adoption in the Bible time? You know, when we think about adoption, I adopt somebody from somebody else's parents, and he becomes my child. And they did that in the Bible time. They take somebody that's a child, and they would adopt them. But the idea of adoption is not just taken from a different parent,
but even of your own child, when your child became of a certain age, that was like the adoption process. And what that meant is, have you ever heard of the bar mitzvah? At the age of 13, Jewish boys, and there's a thing for the girls too, but Jewish boys at the age of 13 become, quote, fully grown, and they are accountable for what they do under the law. They, they become, as it were, fully grown at a bar mitzvah. And so the adoption was not just as we think of it, but it was that like bar mitzvah where children or sons became, as it were, fully grown, and now I can send you out into the field, not as a servant, but I'll send you out into the field as the boss. Or I'll send you to the next country over if you're the son of a king, not as a servant, but I'll send you over it and you tell them, this is what you must do. I send you with authority. And so as, as, a, as that, that's what he's saying there in verse 5, that we might receive the adoption. So that's to be, as it were, full, not servants under the law, but now a fully grown son. And, and if I could just ask us to even think along this line, realize that as children of God, we're not only saved and kept, but we have some entitlement. And the entitlement is, you know, we're God's children, but we're his heirs, and he's given us authority in prayer. He's given us authority in representing him. You know, and, you know, the world may despise us, but we're God's property. You know, we're not just a piece of dirt. You know, we're, you know, you are someone special to God. You, you are, and I'm trying to give the idea of there's authority in being a child of God. Doesn't mean we're better than anyone else, you know, on the physical level or whatever, or humanly. But as children of God, when he saves you, he gives you authority to represent him. And so um, that was the purpose, to redeem them and then the, the adoption. And so that's, uh, that's the uh, spiritual adoption. And then a second thing to do with our privilege is spiritual assurance and affluence or affluence, and that's in verse 6 and 7. And because ye are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So as sons, being the children of God, he sent the spirit of his sons. And who is that? Well, it's the Holy Spirit, but also it says the spirit of his son. And then the effect of the spirit in us is Abba, Father. And they say the Greek uh, or the, the uh, translators of the King James, they didn't want to translate the word Abba, so they just put it Abba. And the reason why there's just not a word that fully expresses, an English word that fully expresses that idea of Abba. Now we would say maybe the, the closest would be to, to say of God that he's your daddy. But who would, who would, you know, who would feel comfortable in calling God your daddy? Some people have, but, but I sure wouldn't. And that's why the King James translator just put Abba. But it is a very intimate term that a daughter could climb up into her dad's lap and look into his eyes and say, Abba, Father. And the Holy Spirit of God brings us that close that we can look up to heaven and say, Abba, Father. We're his children. He loves us. He accepts us. We can ask for things. We can expect him to lead us. So, let me, uh, let's do something quick here. John 14, verse 16 through 18. John 14, 16 through 18. I should have given somebody a, a microphone and let them read this, but I'll do it. John 14, 16 through 18. Okay, 16 says, Jesus said, And I will pray the Father, and he will give you another comforter, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, 
whom the world cannot receive, because it seeth him not, neither knoweth him. But ye know him, for he dwelleth with you, and shall be in you. Now notice, I will not leave you comfortless, I will come to you. Now it says the spirit of his son was sent into our hearts. And our hearts, that involves your thinking, your feeling, and your willing. So just realize that when you are facing something and you're trying to figure out something, remember that the spirit of Christ is in your heart. He can help you think. He can help you with your feelings. And he can help you in deciding what you need to do. Then just a few pages over, Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, verses 15 through 17. For ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear. That's the Old Testament way. But ye have received the spirit of adoption, which we've been talking about, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. The spirit itself beareth witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God and joint heirs with Christ. If so be that we suffer with him, that we may be also glorified together. So now back in Galatians. Wow, I, all I can say is wow. You know, as to what a blessing that is, this position of him saying here that... Um, verse 7, our key verse... Wherefore thou art no more a servant but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. So is there a difference in Old Testament believers and New Testament believers? Yes. Were Old Testament believers children of God? Yes. They were looking forward by faith. Could the law save them? No. It was always by grace looking forward to the coming and even though they maybe didn't understand what they did, you know, I did things as a child. I didn't understand them, but I, I did them because, you know, you were told to do them. And they may not have understood it all, but in faith they say, well, you know, we're going to trust God. This is what he says to do. And that still applies. Facing trouble? Trust God and let's do what we're supposed to do. Amen. You know, it's always right to do right. Because I don't know what to do. Do right. Even if you don't understand the outcome and all that, just trust God. Do right. And guess what? It'll always turn out better when we do that. So we're, we're no longer as we're in bondage, but truly his children. The heir, when he was under the tutors, the tutor might smack him on the hand. But when he became adopted, that tutor better not smack him on the hand or that heir turn around and smack him on the behind end, wouldn't he? Because it's different now, and uh, it's, he has authority. I want us to look at just a few verses, uh, in which would uh, just kind of point toward next week, and then we're going to wrap things. No, we're not. We don't have time. I want to share just a couple of uh, closing thoughts. J. Vernon McGee. You ever heard of J. Vernon McGee on the radio? We love to hear him teach. He teaches the Bible. He said uh, when he had cancer... He was in the hospital, I think, at Pasadena, where he was many years ago before he passed away. And uh, he, uh, after this surgery cancer, he lived for a good number of years. But anyway, he said, he said uh, I had this little gown on, and the nurse came in and said, can I help you get in bed? She, he said, no, I'm scared to death. And that's what he said. And he said, give me a minute. And when she left, he said, dear Heavenly Father, I've come to this hospital many times. And I've prayed for people and put my hand on their shoulder and I've told them it's going to be okay. And then I turn and I walk out of the hospital and I leave. But Lord, this time it's me. And I'm not walking out of this hospital. I'm the one. And he said, uh, he said, I had things I wanted to ask the Lord. I wanted to ask the Lord to do this and do that and fix it this way. But he said, you know what I did? He said, I said, dear Heavenly Father, you are my Father. And I put myself in your hands. Whatever you think best, you do. And J. Vernon McGee explained, he said, you know, when things are going well, many times we don't have that Abba Father closeness to the Lord. On sunny days, we go our own ways. 
But you know, when trouble and storms come, that's when it's the opportunity for us to get close to God. And you know what God does? He does speak to us, and we know that He is truly in our life in the hard days, in the hard days. Some of the verses we've read from Romans and John explain that. I'm going to give you one more point, and that's the idea of a bondage. You know, we're not under the Old Testament law, but, but there are people that just have an over-sensitive conscience. And even though they're saved, they live under what somebody has called the tyranny of the oughts. They ought to do more, ought to do better, and they may be some of the most spiritual people in the church, but they just never seem to be at peace. They always feel guilty. They feel like they've not done enough. They, you know, how could God love them? Um, that's not good thinking. But yet it's prone. You know, many of us are, are prone to think of that because, you know, we don't measure up. We, you know, you hold us up to the mirror and to the light. You know, we're not perfect people. Some of the verses he gives us here, verse 7, Thou art no more a servant but a son. Let's not feel like God is keeping score that you, this is what you got to do and this is what you got to do. Though those things, it's, it's right to obey. We've already gone over that. But the attitude ought to be that I am a child of God. He loves me. I want to do the best I can for him. But he loves me and if I fail, I'm going to make it right. I'm not going to stay in defeat. But just don't live under bondage. He doesn't want you to. He doesn't want you to feel like a servant. You know, a servant will lose his job if he doesn't do everything the boss says to do. But as children, God's not going to fire you. He's not going to kick you off his role. So, we're not under bondage. Amen? Good. Dear Lord, we do thank you for your love and goodness to us. And let us... Let us enjoy our relationship as being a child of God and having the freedom to, as it were, crawl up into your lap and look into your face and say, and you're my father. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. The Lord bless you.